stayed up all night wondering where the sun had gone, and then it dawned on me. All right, you did it. You are on lesson four. Good job. Uh, we've got a very interesting lesson today as we finish out chapter one, so get ready. All right, so the very first thing we're going to do is that um, last week, or in lesson three, whenever you covered it, is that we continued reading chapter one of Call of the Wild. We examined how the author's word choice impacted the tone and mood of the text. And we also deepened our understanding of Buck's transition into the wild. We talked about how his beatings, uh, the specific words that were used to indicate Buck's beatings, really affected the tone and the mood of that scene. Uh, the author could have chosen to just say, Buck was beat on the nose and he decided to obey. But he didn't. He went into a lot of graphic detail describing the blood and the pain and the fire and the anger. And what that did for us is it built the intensity for us. We really felt Buck being demolished or broken down into a very primal state or a very primitive state. Okay, back to his wolf origins. Uh, that is where we left off. Buck was beaten. So today what we're going to do is we're going to finish reading chapter one, discussing and defining some words in context. That means the what they mean in the text. And we are going to uh, read the text together to add, uh, get some evidence for some incidents that happen. There are some events that happen toward the end of the chapter, and we're going to analyze them. Okay, so what you're going to need today is you're going to need Call of the Wild, our favorite book, and uh, your vocabulary chart, of course, uh, the incident chart, which is on page 13 of your blue notebook, and you will need uh, conversation stems, probably not today on that one. Okay, so let's jump in. We're going to begin reading uh, on page 10, right where we left off last time. So on page 10, we left off right after he was beaten, and uh, uh, we noticed that there were some other dogs that came into the picture. Some were beaten and sort of like started to love the man in the red sweater who was beating them. They just gave up and started licking his hand and treating him all nice. Uh, but then there were other dogs who resisted. There was one particular who refused to obey, and that dog was beaten to death. So that's where we've left off. We're going to start on page 10 with now and again. And we're going to read to the end of chapter one. So if you are reading on your own, you can go ahead and do that and skip this portion. Follow along with me with your eyes, okay? Now and again, men came, strangers who talked excitedly, wheedling, and in all kinds of fashions to the man in the red sweater. And at such times that money passed between them, the strangers took one or more of the dogs away with them. Buck wondered where they went, for they never came back. But the fear of the future was strong upon him, and he was glad each time when he was not selected. Yet his time came in the end, in the form of a little weazened man who spat broken English and many strange and uncouth exclamations, which Buck could not understand. Sacredam! he cried, when his eyes lit upon Buck. That one damn bully dog, eh? How much? Three hundred, and a present at that, was the prompt, uh, prompt reply of the man in the red sweater. And seeing it's government money, you ain't got no kick coming, eh? Puro? Perot grinned. Considering that the price of the dogs had been boomed skyward by the unwanted demand, it was not an unfair sum for so fine an animal. The Canadian government would be no loser, nor would its dispatches travel the slower. Perot knew dogs, and when he looked at Buck, he knew that he was one in a thousand. One in ten thousand! He commented uh, mentally. Buck saw money pass between them and was not surprised when Curly, a good-natured Newfoundland, 
and he were led away by the little weazened man. That was the last he saw of the man in the red sweater. And as Curly and he looked at receding Seattle from the deck of the narwhal, it was the last he saw of the warm Southland. Curly and he were taken below by Perrault and turned over to a black-faced giant called Francois. Perrault was a French-Canadian and swarthy, but Francois was a French-Canadian half-breed and twice as swarthy. They were a new kind of men to Buck, of which he was destined to see many more. And while he developed no affection for them, he nonetheless grew honestly to respect them. He speedily learned that Perrault and Francois were fair men, calm and impartial in administering justice, and too wise in the way of dogs to be fooled by dogs. In the tween decks of the narwhal, Buck and Curly joined two other dogs. One of them was a big, snow-white fellow from Spitzenberg, Spitzbergen, who had been brought away by a whaling captain, and who had later accompanied a geological survey into the Barrens. He was friendly in a treacherous sort of way, smiling into one's face the while he meditated some underhanded trick, as, for instance, when he stole Buck's food at the first meal. As Buck sprang to punish him, the lash of Francois's whip sang through the air, reaching the culprit first, and nothing remained to Buck but to recover the bone. That was fair of Francois, he decided, and the half-breed began his rise in Buck's estimation. The other dog made no advances, nor received any. Also, he did not attempt to steal from the newcomers. He was a gloomy, morose fellow, and he was and he showed Curly plainly that all he desired was to be left alone, and further, there would be trouble if he were not left alone. Dave, he was called. And he ate and slept, or yawned between times, and took interest in nothing, not even when the narwhal crossed the Queen Charlotte Sound and rolled and pitched and bucked like a thing possessed, when Buck and Curly grew excited, half wild with fear, he raised his head as though annoyed, favored them with an incurious glance, yawned, and went to sleep again. Day and night the ship throbbed to the tireless pulse of the propeller, and though one day was very like another, it was apparent to Buck that the weather was steadily growing colder. At last, one morning, the propeller was quiet, and the narwhal was pervaded with an atmosphere of excitement. He felt it, as did the other dogs, and knew that a change was at hand. Francois leashed them and brought them on deck. At the first step upon the cold surface, Buck's feet sank into white, mushy something very like mud. He sprang back with a snort. More of this white stuff was falling through the air. He shook himself, but more of it fell upon him. He sniffed it curiously, then licked some up on his tongue. It bit like fire, and the next instant was gone. This puzzled him. He tried it again with the same result. The onlookers laughed uproariously, and he felt ashamed. He knew not why, for it was his first snow. Very good. You just finished reading chapter one, uh, and we're going to look at one of these words in context here. Context, again, means what does the word mean in the sentence and the paragraph it's used in. Uh, words can mean a lot of different things, and when we say in context, con means with, and text means text. So context means with the text. What does this word mean in the text with the text? So the word here is treacherous. It's to be found on page 12, uh, the very first full paragraph on page 12. 
Uh, so read along with me on the screen here, and uh, you should be turning to your vocabulary chart and filling in the word uh, treacherous here. But read along with me first. He was friendly in a treacherous sort of way, smiling into one's face the while he meditated some underhand trick, as, for instance, when he stole from Buck's food at the first meal. So let's look at this word treacherous. Looking at the context there, I want you to make a guess about what this means. Looking at the context, what does this dog do? And what can that tell us about the word treachery here? Push pause on the video, fill in the word treacherous, and make your best guess about what this word means. Go ahead and push pause. Okay, so you're back. You have read over treacherous here, and I think what we can see here is uh, if we look at the context, he says he was friendly in a treacherous way. So friendly is one, uh, in a treacherous way. He was smiling in one's face. All the while, he meditated on some trick, underhand trick. And an example of this, the instance of this, or an example of this, is when he stole Buck's food. So he's a friendly, smiling person, but he was thinking about how to steal Buck's food. And then we have this word treacherous. Okay, So go ahead and look up the word treacherous. Uh, you can look it up online. But don't just copy the definition. Look at the definition online and look at the context here and go and write down your own definition. What does this word treacherous mean here in this text? Go ahead and uh, draw yourself a picture of it or use it in a proper sentence and then we will move on to the next slide. Okay, all right, so you just finished looking at the word treacherous. Now what we're going to do is turn to page 13 in our blue folder and analyze an incident, okay? So go ahead and turn to page 13 in your blue folder. I'll give you a second to get there. Pause if you need to. Okay. So the way this chart works, you'll see on the left-hand side it says incident summary. And on the right-hand side it says observations and inferences. So an incident means a thing that happened. Okay, an event or a thing that happened. And on the right-hand side, observations and, and observations and inferences I'll get it. Don't worry. Don't you worry. Um, is what you observe, what you think about, where you're like, hmm, what does this really mean? What's the deeper significance of this? So what we're going to be doing is looking at a couple of events that happened and thinking about what can we learn about the characters from this. We're still in the exposition of the story. We're still in the beginning of the story. We're introducing characters and setting. Okay. So let's look at, first of all, what happens with Spitz. This slide says, consider the incident about Spitz. What happens? What does this interaction between Spitz and Buck suggest about the characters and their relationships? So the first question, what happens with Spitz? You're going to fill that in in this little box right here, okay? This little box, boop, because we are summarizing the incident. I meant to make that red, but you get the idea. So this little box right here, what happens in the incident with Spitz? And you can go back to page 12, very top of page 12, and just reading down that first you know, half paragraph and then the next paragraph that follows. Um, go ahead and push pause on the video and just describe in basic words what happened, who did what to who. All right, push pause. Okay, you're back. You filled in exactly what happened with Spitz. Now... I want you to interpret what can we learn about Spitz? What can we learn about this interaction between Spitz and Buck? What do you think the relationship between Spitz and Buck is going to be like? And that's what you're going to fill in here. Whoops! You're going to fill it in right here. This little box is your observation. What do you think Spitz and Buck are going to do to each other? How do you think they're going to interact with each other based on what's happened so far? Okay, go ahead and fill that in, and then when you're done, you'll move on to the next slide. All right, very good. So you finished analyzing in your own words what we learned about Spitz and Buck's relationship. Okay, let's look now at Francois. So in that same paragraph, we see Francois uh, holding a whip. And uh, so what can we learn about Francois here? 
Right. He's not a dog. Okay. Hint. He's holding a whip. Okay. So he's not a dog. Uh, so we learn this, and he's actually in charge. He's the one that keeps the dogs in line. So what we learn in this moment is uh, when we look at this sentence, it says, As Buck sprang to punish him, to punish Spitz for taking his food, the lash of Francois's whip sang through the air, reaching the culprit first. Culprit means the person who did the crime. So this is talking about Spitz. So Spitz goes, takes a bone. Buck tries to jump at him, but Francois whips Spitz. He whips him. Okay? Uh, Spitz drops the bone, and nothing was left but for Buck to recover it. So Buck just walked over and picked up the bone, and he's back to normal. And it says that was fair of Francois, he decided. And the half-breed, uh, Francois is a half-breed, he's half French, half Canadian, uh, began to rise in Buck's estimation. So look at this incident as well. Go ahead and plot this incident. Describe exactly what happened here in this uh, second box. Describe what happened. And then what we can learn about the character Francois here. All right, so you finished analyzing um, Francois and that incident. Uh, finally, I'm going to give you a choice here. You can either analyze the incident at the end of the chapter, uh, the last paragraph about Buck discovering snow for the first time. You can either analyze that event or any other event that's happened in the book so far that can tell us about the character of Buck. And you'll do that here in your third little... Uh, little thingy okay so whatever event right there and then the deeper meaning or deeper representation what can you learn about buck by watching this man this is a simple thing he's never seen snow before and he acts like a fool <laughs> what can we learn about him i mean what does that tell us about his likelihood of doing well in the wild hint hint so you can look at that one or look at another one then move on to the next slide very good. You have totally completed your incident chart. You've totally completed all the boxes in there with complete sentences, mind you. Go back and fix it if you didn't. In this lesson, you finished reading Chapter 1 of Call of the Wild by Jack London. You analyzed some incidents from the chapter more deeply to understand the characters and their relationships and the key themes of the text. Well done. Move on to the next lesson.